Hello from La Hinch County Clare on the west coast of Ireland. I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. My guest in this episode is Father Peter McVerry, a Belfast-born Jesuit priest who grew up in Newry County Down before moving to Dublin. After his ordination in 1975, he lived and worked in the Summerhill area of Dublin City and came face to face with homelessness, poverty and deprivation. He went on to set up a trust to help struggling young people, including those facing addiction. This work started life in a three-bedroom apartment in Ballymun and later became the Peter McVerry Trust, which grew to include hostels, apartments, a detox centre and other services for people affected by addiction and homelessness. It is now one of the largest and most important organisations of its kind in Ireland. Father McVerry has consistently been one of the most outspoken critics of government policy on housing and homelessness and is one of Ireland's most respected campaigners and activists, a man who's very much walking his talk. It was great to get the time to talk with Peter over Zoom and you can see the video version of this episode over on the Love and Courage YouTube channel or on my Facebook page. Just look up Rory McKiernan, Hitching for Hope, and you should find it there. Before we get started, I want to say a big welcome to any new listeners to the podcast. You're very, very welcome. Good to have you on board. After listening to this episode, please consider checking out the archive and subscribe, rate and review and share and all of that if you do get a chance. And a big thanks to all of you podcast patrons, those of you who chip in on once off or on a monthly basis, people from all around the world who help power the podcast. I'm really grateful to you for your support. And if you do want to chip in on a once off monthly basis, you can pop over to loveandcourage.org. It takes just a minute and no pressure at all to do so. Thanks to to all who've been supporting my book, Hitching for Hope, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland, and for helping make it a bestseller. It's available on paperback and as an ebook and an audio book, and you can find it in all the main bookstores and on the various book selling websites. I also have some signed copies available, and you can find out more about this, including very various free conversational events I'm doing online with different groups in the US, the UK, the Netherlands, Hungary, South Africa and Australia. And all that information is at hitchingforhope.com. That's hitchingforhope.com. Before I forget, I also want to say I've just launched another podcast. It's called the Creative Souls of Clare podcast. I interview various musicians and artists and different kinds of creative souls from living in County Clare. And you can find that on all the usual podcast platforms also and a big thanks to Creative Ireland for their support to get that podcast up and running. So back to the main event here this latest episode of the Love and Courage podcast is with Father Peter McVerry and it's time to get started. It's a wonderful conversation with a wonderful human being that is Father Peter McVerry. I hope you enjoy. Peter, thanks very much for your time, for joining me on the Love and Courage podcast. When I think of um, the words love and courage in the podcast title, they're very much words I associate with you. Um, I'm sure you probably shy away from the word courage because I've heard you speak in the past and you, I don't know, there's a certain humility to your life and to your action that you maybe shy away from seeing yourself as courageous. But we'll start with the love bit and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> we might get I might get away on that front. Could you tell me what love means to you, Peter, and, and how it informs your life and your practice and your work. Well, I think if two people are in love, the essence of that is that each puts the other first in their life. Each is more concerned about the uh, uh, making the other happy than they are about making themselves happy. And if that's not the basis of their relationship, then it's not going to last. So for me, love is about putting other people first, Uh, whether it's somebody close to us, a partner or a child or a parent, uh, or whether it's just other people. For me, it's homeless people. Uh, Putting other people first uh, is what what love is about. So that's been my life. It's uh, it's not something I chose. It's something that happened to me, but I'm delighted that it happened to me. Uh, but I do now, uh, yeah, homeless people now are at the heart of my uh, day and at the heart of my, uh, the heart of my life. Uh, I'm available to homeless people pretty well 24 hours a day if they want me. Uh, and it's sort of trying to 
trying to meet their needs, particularly the need to be cared for. That's what homeless people mostly want. They want to believe that somebody cares about them. And do you think and that within that care is is the notion of love or the emotion of love that they 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 want to feel loved? They want to feel yeah loved and cared for. I'm not sure if there's a huge difference between the two, but they do want to feel that somebody cares. And all you need in life is one person to believe that one person cares for you. That makes a huge difference. If you feel that nobody cares for you then your life is pretty. You ask yourself, what's the meaning of my life? What's the point of my life? Uh, so I think that, uh, yeah, caring, putting other people first in your life and putting yourself out for other people is, to me, what love and care is about. And when you say this is not a life that you chose, that that it happened, can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I never intended to uh, work with homeless people. Uh, I Originally, I thought I was going to be a teacher in a school, and I was getting prepared for that. Uh, then I went to the inner city of Dublin to live and to work, and that had a total transformation effect on me. Uh, I became a different person. I got to know people in the inner city, people who were often written off by society, uh, where there was a huge amount of crime, where there was a huge amount of deprivation. Uh, I got to know those people, <clears throat> and I began to be, get, to be angry at why people in the inner city were left in the situation uh, which they find themselves in, with uh, in living in poverty, living in the most appalling housing uh, complexes, and with almost uh, no chance of ever getting a job. So the issue for me when I went to the inner city was young people leaving school early with no prospects of uh, ever getting a job. It wasn't homelessness until I came across a nine-year-old kid sleeping on the street. And then I said, look, we got to do something for this kid and for others like him. So we opened a small little hostel for six boys up to the age of 16. Uh, and that then became my life's work. It just uh, it just developed. It snowballed after that. We I ran the hostel for a couple of years. Kids were leaving that hostel then uh, and going back onto the streets. So we had to open another hostel for the older kids. Then we the numbers grew and grew and grew. We had to open another hostel. Then the Child Care Act came in and we had to separate out the under-18s from the over-18s. We had to open another hostel. Then the drug problem hit Dublin. We had 14-year-olds coming to us injecting heroin, so we had to open a detox centre. So there was no plan to it. We just I just went from year to year. Uh, and the whole thing just unfolded, uh, you know, in a way that I never had planned, I had never intended, uh, but uh, delighted it actually did unfold the way it did. Do you think that um, that notion of service, uh, where you serve the community, that, you know, the, where the need arises, it's our, our duty to respond and and we relinquish then, we let go and, and just follow the thread of the response to, to allow it to take us where it needs to go? That's what happened in my case. But there comes a point where you have to sit down and plan and plan ahead for the future. You can't just simply drift along from year to year and create a sustainable uh, organization which can, re re which can reach out to meet the needs of others. So we had, we had to create a sustainable organization. So about 15 years ago, I was getting too old anyway. Uh, and if I had died 15 years ago, the whole thing would have collapsed because I was everything. I was the managing director. I was the finances. I was the electrician. I was everything. So we decided we had to put it onto a sustainable uh, basis so that if anything happened to me, it would continue. So we got in. Uh, we, we employed a CEO who's absolutely fantastic, uh, Pat Doyle. Uh, and the organization now has grown to such an extent, you need somebody with the competence, which I didn't have, the competence to run a large organization. We now have 500 full-time staff. We have a budget of 30 million. Um, that requires a level of, uh, of organizational competence, 
which, as I say, I didn't have and which I didn't want to do. I don't want to spend my days <laughs> adding up money and making sure it's uh, nothing, uh, making sure the accounts yeah. balance. And, yeah. Uh, so uh, that was an important step from the 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 year to year. Just let's go from year to year. That was an important step in putting this organization onto a sustainable uh, level. I'm I'm sure also within that that you didn't imagine that the problem would continue to grow to the extent that it has grown and that therefore the the need of the response continues to grow you know that that in the the campaigning community nonprofit charity sector we continue to have to fundraise to build organizations to hire staff to raise volunteers and at what point do we systemically shout stop fundamentally and that's where I guess the the critical voice and the activist voice continues to be needed, which I, for one, am grateful that you have continued to keep that balance. Would you see that as a, a juggling act in terms of the response and and almost the fight to stem the tide? Yeah, I, I would feel that you can't just uh, you can't just run services for homeless people without looking at the bigger picture. Why are there homeless people? And why is the problem continuing to get worse? And so you have, and that's political. Homelessness is a political problem. And the solution to homelessness is political. So I say, I wouldn't be happy just running uh, services for homeless people without also challenging the political process and challenging the, uh, the, the decisions that are made at a political level. So I felt I had to become activist. Uh, and we were lucky once we... Uh, I, I was always I, I was always critical. I was always an activist, but once we uh, got in our CEO Pat Doyle to run the organisation, it became easier actually to be a, an activist because he runs the organisation. He's the one who deals with government ministers and government departments. Uh, I don't anymore, so that frees me up to be critical. Mm. So it's a sort of good cop, bad cop. And yeah, bad. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving out about government departments, and he's working closely with government departments. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, and that that was uh, that was. Well, uh, you know, I suppose any real uh, fundamental and healthy change requires a kind of multifaceted approach. That sometimes we need to work with the the systems as well as challenge the systems. I'm just wondering, Peter. Um, and do you do you have early memories in your life of when maybe a, a critical thinker emerged, or was there an influence there from parents or community? Was was the north a factor? Was there what were the influences that came to bear early on for you? Uh, well, certainly my parents were a big influence. Uh, my father was a doctor in a small town, and in days before you had a practice, before he had other doctors helping him out to uh, look after uh, nights, uh, night calls or to look after weekends. He was a doctor. He had his patients. And if a patient called at three o'clock in the morning, he had to go out. There was nobody else to, uh, to do it. So I remember as a young child, the phone frequently going at nighttime, sometimes twice in the night. And my father would get up, go out and see his patients. And never did I hear a word of complaint. Uh, so I think I got a sense of service from him. And then my mother was a Welsh Protestant who converted to Catholicism in order to marry my father. Because in those days, in those days, back in the 1930s and, uh, and 40s, if a Catholic married a Protestant, they were going to go to hell for all eternity. So to avoid that fate, my mother became a Catholic. And like many converts, became more Catholic than the Catholics themselves. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a very, we had mass every Sunday, of course, but also a family rosary every evening. You couldn't miss it. No excuses taken. Uh, so I got a sense of faith from my mother. So when I was in school and I was deciding what I wanted to do, I think I felt I wanted to be of service to other people in a faith context, and therefore becoming a priest was was mm -hmm. one way of doing that. So I said, I'll give it a I'll give it a try, uh, and I never looked back. I've never regretted the decision to become a Jesuit priest. Uh, I feel very very fulfilled as a Jesuit priest, and if I were to start my life all over again, I'd do exactly the same. So I think my parents had a huge influence on me. Mm. Then there were other uh, uh, people, uh, Jesuit priests uh, in, the, in America, like the Berrigan brothers, who were very politically active, went to jail for their activism. 
uh, people in South America who, again, were very politically active and died for it. Uh, people in Ireland, like Father Michael Sweetman, who was uh, very politically active in the housing area. So I think they influenced me and said, yeah, my, I want uh, to be a priest. That's what I want to do as a priest. I want to try and change things. I want to try and make the society and the world a better place. And that's a political, uh, that's a political challenge. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, the Berrigan brothers that you mentioned there, and it, it, it conjures up the whole world of uh, liberation theology and the Catholic worker movement. And um, I guess as somebody that was brought up like, like the vast majority of people in, in the south of the country anyway, uh, as a Catholic, and then drifted or chose to go away from it. But in later years, having come in contact with probably what you might call the radical Catholics or the radical Christians, it always struck me then that, well, this is what it's supposed to be about anyway, isn't it? Like, you know, if, if, if you were to really look at Gospels and, and Christianity, you would be looking at solidarity with the poor and challenging the oppressors. Absolutely, of course. That's, that's it's, my read. It's fairly my... straightforward in one sense. <laughs> well, I think it is. Other people don't. Uh, you've uh, Catholics in uh, in America who are totally opposed to Pope Francis and, and totally have spiritualized the gospel in terms of the uh, individualistic, pious uh, relationship with uh, with Jesus. For me, the gospels are extraordinarily radical. Jesus reached out to the poor and the marginalized. He uh, challenged the uh, the status quo. He uh, he was angry. I often think you can't understand the Gospels unless you're angry, because Jesus was angry. He was angry when he threw the buyers and sellers out of the temple. He was angry when he called the Pharisees, you hypocrites. He was angry when they wouldn't let him heal uh, a person on the Sabbath because it was against the law. Jesus was angry. Uh, and I think that anger comes through in the Gospels. So for me... My reading of the gospel is, you know, we unless we commit ourselves to building a better world and to building a fairer world and a more just world, we're not following the gospel. We may be following some idealistic notions we have ourselves, but uh, we're not following the gospel. So for me, the gospel is extraordinarily radical. And why do you think ultimately, I mean, is it innate in human nature or is it the temptations or... Um, the way kind of systems create and, and capture movements or, or people or organizations. Like why did that get lost? Why, why did the church move away from all of that? Well, I think historically it moved away in the, about the year 400 when, uh, first, when Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. And so uh, churches then were built in every town and city in the in, in the Roman Empire, which was the whole known world. So the church became very respectable. It had the ear of those in authority. Uh, and because it became respectable uh, and had the uh, access to those in authority, it became wealthy because the wealthy people wanted to find favor with the church. So the church became powerful and it became wealthy. And I think it went downhill after that. So do, uh, do you, could you say that that, you know, is a, almost a collusion with, with power? Well, that's actually what happened. Yes, yeah. uh, they enjoyed the power. Uh, uh, they benefited from the power and they felt they could use the power to promote the faith. But ultimately, I think it uh, it damaged yeah. the, the church and the church's and, credibility. And do you see risks yourself, Peter, in, in the realm of the nonprofit world and particularly now where the trust is at and your organization being the size it is and, and dealing with the volumes of people and finance and staff and now you have access to government that you could become the church in this light if, if you don't well, I never vigilant, want to be, you know? <laughs> I never want to be in bed with the government with 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 the powers that be uh, no I would always want to keep a critical uh, voice because as I say the issue of, of of homelessness and indeed most issues of justice are political uh, and therefore, we have to continually challenge the uh, uh, the political powers to to do more. So I don't ever think I would be uh, 
would be happy to uh, to throw in my lot with with any political ideology. No. So I, I just want to go back, Peter, to uh, those early days before you uh, went off to join the priesthood. And can you talk to me about what your uh, what life was like in the wider community and what was happening in the the cultural, social, and political world around you? Well, Ireland back in the fifties uh, was a very very stable place. There was a very clear uh, culture there. It was a Christian culture. Uh, everybody went to mass. If you didn't go to mass, you were seen as some sort of outsider. Uh, clearly, that that culture was, uh, you know, everybody absorbed that culture. There were very, very negative aspects to that culture. We see that in the situation of uh, girls who got pregnant outside marriage. And they were ostracized and they had to go off and uh, give up their children. That was one of the very negative uh, aspects of the uh, of the culture of the of the 1950s, but it was a very uh, stable, uh, very clear, and in many ways very complacent uh, culture. We didn't realize the uh, what was going on in the world around us. I remember when I first went into the inner city uh, to live and to work. Uh, two things shocked me. First of all, what shocked me was the conditions that people lived in. Uh, but the second thing that shocked me was I had been living in Dublin for many years prior to that. And I had walked through the inner city many times. And I had been totally unaware of the conditions that people lived in in the inner city. And it was my lack of awareness that shocked me even more than the conditions I found people living in. And I think that affects all of us. We are, uh, we, we do lack awareness because we don't have any personal contact with uh, often the victims of injustice or the victims of, uh, of poverty. And until we do have that personal contact, I think it's very hard for us to become aware. You can watch documentaries on different political issues. You can read articles in the newspapers about different political issues. But it's only when it comes home to us that it becomes a real, uh, it becomes a real issue. So people talk to me about homelessness and I say to them, look, the most important thing you can do is go up and have a few words with some homeless people. Get to know some homeless, get to talk to them, get to know them a tiny little bit. Mm-hmm. And that being, can begin to change our attitudes uh, towards people who are poor, to people who are homeless, to people who are involved in crime even. Many of the people I deal with have been involved in in crime, uh, and yet there's another side to them. There's another side to them which the public don't see. They just see the criminality, but there can be another side to them, uh, uh, who, which is, is is hidden. Nobody is a one-dimensional person. We've got to see the whole person, the good and the bad, and that's in all of us, the good and the bad. And we've got to recognize that, that that is in all of us. And that helps us to be non-judgmental of others that we may be uh, that we may be constantly giving out about. It it strikes me that the parallels there with um, the well, firstly we were talking about the fifties and and um, mothers being sent to homes and so on, and and now, and the homeless, and also now people in direct provision centres and and family hubs and so on. Do you think there's a there's a history of kind of institutionalizing and warehousing away our perceived problems that we don't have to look at them or we don't have to connect with people that we can kind of other them and not not have to um, embrace them into the into the human family, if you like. Yeah, I think that's an increasingly uh, dominant uh, uh, process that's happening in our society. You know, in the old days, in the 40s and 50s, homeless people were highly respected. <laughs> They were called the Knights of the Road, uh, and they were well looked after, and they went from town to town, and there were workhouses there, not great places, but at least they got beds for the night, and they got shelter, and they could have a shower, and they could have food, they could stay a while until they wanted to move on to the next uh, to the next town. I think today, two things have happened. One, our culture has become far more individualistic. It's all about me, me, me. And we have also become much wealthier. 
And the problem with becoming much wealthier is the more we have, the more we have to protect. And therefore, the more we have to keep other people out. And so it's at the opposite solidarity. Uh, it's the opposite of reaching out to people. No, we have to keep people out so that we protect what we have. So I think we've become far more individualistic, far more uh, judgmental of people who are different from us. Uh, and that then uh, creates a society in which we, what do we do with people who are different? Yeah, we lock them up, basically. The number of people in our prisons with mental health problems are huge. The number of people who are homeless is enormous. Uh, the number 70% of, uh, of those who go to prison have an addiction. You know, a person with an addiction needs help, not punishment. <laughs> but they're not getting the help they need, and so they end up in prison. People with mental health problems need help, not punishment, but they're not getting it. And indeed, some judges send people to prison with mental health problems because they believe they're going to get better treatment in prison than they would outside. Uh, and homelessness, I am constantly inundated with requests from prisoners and from the prison system uh, that they're getting out uh, soon, they have nowhere to go. Can we provide them with accommodation? Indeed, I now say that, you know, there are many people in prison now who are more terrified of coming out of prison than of going into prison because they're coming out to nothing. You leave prison with maybe five euro in your pocket, nowhere to go, nothing to do. Uh, and then we wonder why they, why they become repeat offenders. Yeah. Recidivism, so, and, and it makes no uh, economic sense for the state either. No, I mean, they're spending 70000 a year keeping somebody in prison. Uh, it's an enormous amount of money. And if they had invested in uh, addiction services and proper mental health services, many of those people may not end up in, in, in prison. Uh, it's, I know one, I got one phone call from a prisoner and he said, Peter, I'm very disappointed. I got three months imprisonment today. I was hoping for nine months <laughs> because in prison I have a bed, I have three meals a day, my medical needs are all looked after. Outside, I have nothing. Uh, so we do, we are warehousing, we're using our prisons to warehouse people that we don't want to have to deal with. Uh, and that is a scandal and it's an, it is an injustice. So, so there's no doubt that uh, administrators and bureaucrats and, and sort of bean counters control a lot of policy in a, in a lot of areas, but their, their kind of logic is fundamentally flawed if we do an, a, a basic assessment on the finances because it doesn't add up. But besides that, um, it, it really strikes me that there's a fundamental lack of not just basic social social policy, but uh, sociological understanding, but also like a lack of compassion. So there's, it feels like there's a moral compass completely around. Uh, and I mean, I'm wondering what you tend to feel when you go into meetings with cabinet ministers and you've, and this isn't about any particular party or, or minister, because you've probably seen them all come and go at this point and the story <laughs> repeat itself. Like, what do you feel is going on in the, in the, at the individual level within the political complex there? I think people often feel very powerless to bring about change. Systems are very powerful. And we become accustomed to systems. I remember when I first went into the prisons, that's over 40 years ago. When I went first into the prisons, uh, particularly into the juvenile prison system in St. Patrick's Institution, I was quite horrified at the conditions. But after going in there for six months or nine months, I became used to it. And I, I didn't become horrified any longer. And that worried me. Mm. That worried me that I had simply become used to it. So I think we have systems. Systems have a powerful life of their own. They are very difficult to change. And people who go into the system, like administrators and policymakers, uh, they adapt to the system rather than changing the system. Uh, and so I think we all need to be able to stand back from what we're doing, stand back from the systems we're involved in and look at them from outside. That's sort of like a retreat process. We have to go on a sort of a retreat and look at the systems we're involved in from the outside mm. uh, and uh, begin then to challenge those systems from the inside. And that's very difficult, challenging a system from the inside, a system that doesn't want to change 
you're going to find your co-workers will be opposed to you. Your co-workers will think you're, you're, you're ideological or you're mad or you're a naive or something. Very, very difficult yeah. to, to challenge and change a system. But we got to do it. And therefore, there has to be outside voices which are challenging the system and trying to help people to see uh, the system, not from the inside, but from the outside. Yeah, and and I suppose the other dynamic that can be at play as well is if we go back to that word around collusion, um, and when one sort by not challenging the system, one can do relatively well for oneself in Absolutely. in career terms or financial terms because we kind of reinforce the system and propel. We can therefore be propelled up the ladder, and I mean to to be a what could be perceived to be a troublemaker in a system, the system will probably be inclined to spit you out. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I think we have in this country a history of, uh, you know, respect for authority. We believe, when I was growing up, I remember, I used to think that every decision the government ever made <laughs> was a great decision for Ireland. Mm. I just trusted in authority. Uh, and I think a lot of people trust in authority. Uh, and they look at the homeless and they say, well, if they could do anything better, they would do it. Of course they would. We trust in authority. And so it's very difficult then to uh, uh, mm. to challenge authority. Uh, yeah, I remember you saying once that um, about the last government, I think, well, that you felt they were ideologically incapable of uh, addressing the homelessness crisis. And it, it really hit a chord with me. It, it just struck me that they were locked into some sort of mindset, belief or ideology that they were imprisoned by and, and couldn't. The, the ability to address the spiraling housing and homelessness crisis was, wasn't there. Or isn't there? Yeah, well, we're all locked. We're all locked into an ideology of some sort or other. Uh, but uh, th- there's a worldwide ideology. Uh, it's often called neoliberalism, and the belief is that the solution to all our problems lies with the private sector. The private sector can come in. They can do things much more efficiently. They can do things much more quickly. And with competition within the private sector, they can do things much more cheaply. And so you get governments who have that ideology, who believe that the solution to our homeless and housing crisis lies with the private sector. The solution to our childcare sex, uh, needs lies with the private sector. Solution to our care of the elderly lies with the private sector. We have privatized pretty well everything in our society. Uh, and certainly, while that may work in some areas, it does not work in the housing area. The, uh, the, the reliance on the private sector has proved over the last 20 years, it has proved to have failed. Look at the situation we're in today. Most young people growing up cannot afford to, to purchase a house. It's beyond their ability to get a mortgage. Uh, we have a homeless crisis that continues to uh, to keep growing. We have people stuck in poor quality private rented accommodation paying exorbitant rents, uh, which they cannot afford. So the this uh, the, that ideology the private sector will provide is, uh, is certainly in, in many public areas has failed. And I think we have got to go back to the state taking responsibility for the basic needs of our citizens, for the housing, the education, uh, and so forth, of our, and the health of our system, of our citizens. And so we have to have public services, very good public services, and that's the state's responsibility. But once you, if your ideology is the private sector, you cannot have a good public, public health system. Because if you have a good public health system, nobody will take out private insurance. <laughs> and so your private insurance market collapses. Uh, so, you know, we, we, so we have to keep the public health system at a very, very poor quality so that people are pushed into the private sector. So what I think and my ideology is that the state is responsible for the basic needs of its citizens, and that includes housing and health and education uh, and so forth. The state is responsible and the state must provide uh, and not delegate that responsibility to the private sector. So, so Peter, you know the obvious um, and constant refrain to that is it tends to be, um, well, who's going to pay for it, you know? 
So, so it's and and immediately you're you're deemed to be a, a communist and a socialist and an anti-democratic <laughs> overlord. <laughs> well, uh, there are many in America who would feel that. I mean, the idea of everybody having access to health insurance in America is considered socialist. Yeah. I suppose what what we need to remind ourselves is this is the norm in in most European countries: the social democracy. It is. It is. We don't. We have. Uh, yeah, in most European countries, France and Germany, you have an excellent public health system. Uh, you used to have it in England as well, uh, but it's deteriorating. You have an excellent public health, public education system. Uh, you don't have this private and uh, and uh, and public divide in 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 education. You have an excellent public health system. So for me, that's my that's my ideology that the state is responsible. It can delegate that responsibility, but it must or it can delegate the delivery of services. Mm. Yeah. Uh, such as homelessness to voluntary bodies, but it must ultimately take responsibility both for the funding and for the quality of those services. And for the uh, the the uh, those services reaching everybody who needs it, state must accept responsibility mm. for the services, even if it wants to delegate them. And I believe in them delegating. I think I would, uh, you know, I I don't want the state running homeless services because I don't think they do a good job. I think the private se- the voluntary sector can do a much better job. But the state must continue must uh, take ultimate responsibility. And I look at some of the homeless uh, shelters that we have. I mean, some of them are excellent, excellent, but some of them are just appalling. Uh, and the state should be stepping in and saying, no, that is not what we want as homeless shelters. Uh, and I've called for HICWA to, ins- to be responsible for inspecting homeless shelters. And if they did, some of them would be closed down overnight. And that's, a, that's the result of the state transferring responsibility for homeless services to the, to the voluntary sector without taking any responsibility for quality of services or for adequate funding of services. I want to go back, Peter, to that. Um, you talked about um, to, to, the need to step back and question and reflect, um, but you, you framed it as... Um, almost like a need for retreat, for a contemplation. How do you uh, cultivate that in your own life on a daily, weekly basis that y- your phone is hopping, there's a never-ending range of pressures, meetings, demands? How do you kind of keep that space for yourself within all of that? Well, actually, that's what uh, that's what that's what creates that space. Uh, I'm no longer involved in the administration of our trust. I'm no longer involved in the finances or the the, the problems that arise in the organisational end of the the trust. So my role now is just dealing with homeless people and uh, listening to them and listening to the issues that they bring up. And that's what makes me angry because I hear those issues every day. I hear those issues, uh, and it makes me angry at those issues which were there 10 years ago are still there today. Mm. Uh, so there's the phrase, you know, you can't see the wood for the trees. Uh, you, you know, you can get so immersed in running the organization mm. that uh, you, you don't see the bigger picture. And luckily I was able to withdraw from running the organization and maintain some perspective uh, on the bigger picture. Uh, so I, I think it's important that we don't get wrapped up in uh, the day-to-day running of an organization, managing staff, managing funding, deal, de- dealing with in, in, with structural problems within the organization. It's important we don't get wrapped up in that completely and that we do have space to listen. Above all, it's about listening. It's about listening to the people who are the, the victims of the structures that we uh, that, that we have created. It's about listening to homeless people, listening to people on the social housing waiting list, listening to young people leaving college who haven't got a hope of ever being able to purchase a home for themselves and their families. Uh, so it's about listening to people. We, we, ha- we can't become so immersed in the running of an organization that we, uh, that we have no time to listen. You used the word uh, creating space there. And one of the things that I'm aware of at the moment as a great privilege is living in the west of Ireland in, in, 
in County Clare, I have an abundance of physical space and natural space around me. And that that that's not um, something to be taken for granted and that so many people in inner cities and elsewhere, there, there's a kind of, um, you know, there's a, a deficit of nature, but also <laughs> like I'm particularly thinking of these times around the pandemic and the restrictions and so on. And I'm, I'm wondering, are you seeing new pressures and new trends because of the pressures of the pandemic? Yeah, the pandemic has, has, has certainly amongst homeless people, it has uh, it has been terrible for many homeless people. All their support services have been withdrawn. You know, drop-in centres where they would go in and have a cup of tea and a sandwich and uh, uh, meet people and have access to advice. Uh, they're, they're all closed. Counselling services are closed. NA meetings and AA meetings are closed. Uh, Every, everything is closed. So the support structures that many homeless people and many of those with a, an addiction, the support structures they depended on were withdrawn. And that's made life very, very difficult for them. Uh, their mental health has deteriorated. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, uh, some of them are relapsing because of the lag. And the treatment centres are closed. People may have been on a waiting list to go into a treatment centre and suddenly they find treatment centres aren't accepting anybody because of the pandemic. So are we looking at a a tsunami coming at us in the next few years, Peter? Like a tsunami of built-up pressures and and relapses? Well, there's certainly going to be a... There's going to be a catch-up process that's going to take time. Yeah, we need to get treatment centres open again, but there will be a backlog of people. So, yeah, we're, we're going to have to live with the consequences of this pandemic, even if we get a vaccine and we can get rid of the pandemic, if that's possible. There's still going to be a backlog of problems. Uh, there's going to be mental health problems, not just for homeless people, but for many others. There's mental health problems which have built up, and it's going to take years uh, to address those and services to address those. Similarly, with addiction uh, pro- uh, uh, problems, and again with homeless problems, many people now have seen a, a sharp drop in their income. Uh, that's going to lead to people not being able to pay the rent, people defaulting on their mortgage, and while there are uh, bans on eviction at the moment from the private rental sector, that's going to end at some stage, and we are going to see a rise in in homelessness again once evictions start to take place. And that that illustrates that by homelessness, <laughs> the vast majority of homeless people have only got one problem, and it's not addiction, and it's not mental health. The only problem the vast majority of homeless people have is they don't have enough money. They don't have enough money to pay the rent. Uh, the majority of people becoming homeless are being evicted from the private rented sector, and they don't have the money to go and get another uh, apartment anywhere, and there's very little social housing they can move into, and they end up being homeless. So, uh, and that's one thing I'm very conscious of. I think we need to change the perception of homelessness. Most people think of homeless people as people sleeping on the street and people begging. They're a tiny minority of the total homeless population. The vast majority of the homeless population are invisible. Uh, you know, we dealt with a, a single father with two children. The landlord sold the house. Uh, they were evicted and they became homeless. No problems there. The two children are wonderful. He looks after them terrifically. Never missed a month's rent, but he just doesn't have the money to go out and get another apartment because you're looking at maybe having to hand over four thousand euros deposit plus for one month's rent. He just doesn't have that. Uh, so, yeah, we need to change that uh, that perception of homelessness as well. That uh, it's not just down and outs who are uh, on down on their luck. Uh, it's 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 ordinary people who are just do not have sufficient money to be able to purchase or rent or or, or purchase their own accommodation. The, 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 some of the rhetoric and narrative that still pervades around homelessness that you, you've talked about there around particular stereotypes that seem very, very outdated and inaccurate. But I'm wondering, like, is that part of the, the agenda, the ideological kind of 
um, cognitive dissonance or whatever it is, or is it just a result of privilege amongst policymakers or, or ministers that they, they've never simply uh, met homeless people? They, they, they're completely, they've grown up with uh, TV notions that are fundamentally inaccurate because you, you continually hear this kind of what has become known as dog whistling, you know, to... I guess victim blaming is another way of putting it as well, that there's a sense that if if somebody has something, if things aren't going well for them, it's ultimately their own fault. They're, as the fella said, not getting up early enough in the morning. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of that. Uh, There certainly is that sense that, uh, you know, in that neoliberal culture that I mentioned already, there is that sense that if you are successful, it's because you have worked hard, you have achieved, uh, you have made sacrifices to get where you are. Uh, but if you if you fall out of the system, it's because you've been lazy, because you ha- wanted to put uh, instant pleasure before uh, before uh, uh, anything else. Uh, that that's part of that that culture that we have grown up with, and it's totally uh, it's totally false. Many of the people who do well, uh, uh, you know, have uh, have been very privileged in their early childhood and early life. And many people who have fallen out of the system have had horrific childhoods. Childhoods full of abuse or violence or uh, drug addicted parents uh, who haven't had a chance uh, from the day they were born in life. Uh, so yeah, that, that ideology, that's part of the ideology. But I think in terms of homelessness, The problem is people don't know homeless people. The only homeless people who are visible are the ones on the street who generally have an addiction problem or a mental health problem or both. And so that shapes the perception of homelessness. And uh, the media perpetuate that perception. If you have an article or a television program on homelessness, you'll always see a person in a sleeping bag in a doorway. And while they exist and while they have certainly got urgent needs, they are, as I say, in a minority of homeless people. And sometimes, unfortunately, we uh, uh, we voluntary organizations use that as well for fundraising. When yeah. we're fundraising, we show yeah. this uh, person in a sleeping bag in a doorway. Yeah. Uh, which is, and so it perpetuates the perception yeah. that all homeless people are like that. And I've often said ministers should be down in the homeless shelters. They should be in the addiction treatment centers. They should be in the drop-in centers, not just dropping in once at the beginning of their term of office, <laughs> but dropping in regularly and listening, above all, listening to people. Because that's what you don't, that's what politicians often don't uh, don't get the chance to do. They don't get the chance to listen, to listen to, to, to people uh, or they're selective about the, the people that they do listen to. They don't get the chance, but also don't make the choice, you know? No, I, also, I say they should be down in the homeless shelters rather than opening motorways. Uh, you know, it's you need. They need to spend time mm. with those who are poor and those who are uh, on the margins. They need to spend time and begin to understand them, mm. and begin to understand their feelings, to begin to understand how they are in that situation and how they feel about changing it. Because you know, the people who have the people who know how to solve homelessness are homeless people themselves. <laughs> Ask any homeless person what do they want. They'll say, I want a key to my own front door. Everybody will say that, you know, and that's obvious. The solution to homelessness is give people a home, but we forget about that. And so we pour money into hostels uh, just to get people off the streets. And then we pour money into family hubs uh, to get them out of hotels. And we think, gosh, we're, we're doing something to solve homelessness. We're not. All we're doing is getting people off the streets. Do you, think the, do you think the fact that I remember reading um, in the Register of Interest in the last government, uh, it worked out that something like a third of the cabinet were private landlords and 40% of the two main parties at the time, what were the two main parties, 40% were landlords. And of the entire Dáil Éireann, 25% are landlords. It, it strikes me that that has to have some sort of influence in policy shaping. Uh, 
Inevitably, it must do. You, If you're a landlord, then your mindset is the mindset of a landlord. Uh, and it can be very difficult to, uh, to try and get into the mindset of your tenants. But uh, yeah, it must it must shape the uh, it shapes the mindset of the people who make the decisions. Yeah, themselves. yeah, because I guess it, it's it's never as black and white as that. You know, a very simplistic view on life is that all landlords are mean and mean, greedy people, which has actually not been my experience at all. But um, yeah, look at the, the 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 politics thing. Where do you see? Any chinks of light, if any, in this political realm, Peter? Uh, well, I would certainly think that the voice of the left wing parties uh, is important and has to be listened to uh, and has to become stronger. Uh, we have an example recently where uh, councillors have voted down a proposal to sell public land to a private developer to build primarily uh, private housing. I think that's a very positive development, uh, that councillors are taking this, this stand. For me, the, one, of the, one of the things I say about solving this housing crisis is public land should be for public housing, not for private housing. Mm. Uh, and so I think that that voice of the, the left wing challenging the right wing ideologies that are dominant in our government, I think that voice is very important. I think there's a lot of grassroots movements as well. Change often comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. Mm. There's a lot of grassroots movements, I think, which uh, over time slowly can grow in strength and put pressure on government to uh, to produce. And I think one of those grassroots movements is going to be ordinary young people leaving college who now realize they will be renting for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. And I think they are going to become angry. They are going to become resentful that a society as wealthy as Ireland cannot allow them to purchase a home. And I think they could become a very significant grassroots movement in the future, putting pressure on government, because they are the ones who are going to vote. The government know they're going to vote. They come from voting families. uh, And if they cannot purchase a home, and if they're stuck in the private rented sector, paying exorbitant rents for for the majority of their lives, they are going to uh, they're going to lead the protest. Well, I look forward to joining them, Peter, because um, you know it's like it's one of the reasons we we've moved to the west of Ireland is because the future rent in, in Dublin, where we were living, uh, my wife and I was paying up to two thousand euro a month, which is where things were going, and it's now gone beyond that, and it's you know it's simply impossible to save money in that. Uh, environment unless you work in high finance or tech or yeah. certain industries. So it, it makes for a very um, imbalanced uh, city for Dublin, for, but for other cities. And I see now that the, the problem has moved into the west of Ireland and elsewhere. So I definitely share your view that it's it's such a fundamental. And like if we boil things down right back to their bare basics, the, the notion of having shelter is so integral to human well-being isn't it yeah you can't uh, you can't live a decent human life dig- with dignity if you don't have your own uh, if you don't have your own space uh, a place you can call your own a place which is secure a place where you feel safe uh, uh, and where you have privacy without that you, your life is uh, is not going to be a, a very humane and dignified mm-hmm. uh, life. So, Peter, we'll finish up now. But before we do, I want to ask you, uh, I'm just something I'm curious about. You told me before we started this podcast that you enjoy a nice cup of coffee. Uh, But I'm wondering how else do you get your energy and and keep your enthusiasm going? And what are your, um, you know, you strike me that you don't shy away from the problems, but you, you do kind of you do sort of radiate a sense of determination and hope. Do you think that's your faith, your your spirituality? No, I think I'm just angry. I hear the voices of homeless people every day. I hear their problems. I hear their issues. I don't see them being resolved very satisfactorily. So I just get angry. And it's anger that uh, 
that keeps me going. You know, anger and love are actually two sides of the one coin. You can't love somebody who's suffering unnecessarily without being angry at what's causing the suffering. So anger for me is a very positive emotion. Obviously, it can explode destructively mm. very often. But if we learn how to channel it, anger yeah. is a very positive uh, uh, emotion. And so I'm angry all the time. That anger keeps you going. You can't, uh, you'd just be betraying yourself if you tried to suppress that anger and say it doesn't matter and uh, I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, no, I, I'm angry. And as I said earlier, I think uh, Jesus was angry. And I think uh, often we maybe can't understand the Gospels unless we're angry. I certainly read the Gospels now in a very different way to the way I read the Gospels 20 or 30 years ago. So the key there is the, the channeling bit, you know, because it's, it's not everyone that can tune into their own sense of anger, but know where to put it. Well, for most people, uh, I think where you put it is by joining organizations, joining organizations who are addressing the same issues that you feel angry about. Uh, yeah, none of us really can can uh, can can uh, uh, let that anger out in an individualistic way. Uh, but we can, by joining organizations and by supporting those organizations, yeah, we can. That's a, a very valid and very fruitful way of of, of expressing the anger that we feel. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you for your, your inspiration, uh, your words, your leadership, your voice. And uh, I know you, you don't want any of this praise at all. So what we'll do is we'll channel the praise into action and we'll encourage everyone listening and watching to take their admiration and praise and bring it onto the streets and into solidarity and into love. Thank you very much, Rory. Pleasure Thank being you, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Rory here again. Thanks for listening. Please check out Peter McVerry Trust if you get a chance and continue to do all you can to push for an end to the housing and homelessness crisis in Ireland and beyond. Please also consider sharing this episode with friends, family and contacts and leaving a rating and review if you get a chance. And remember, you can see the video version of this podcast on the Hitching for Hope Facebook page and on the Love and Courage YouTube channel. If you're new to the podcast, you might consider subscribing to get new notifications of new episodes and also you can chip in over at loveencourage.org and I really do appreciate the support especially from all you monthly patrons it really makes a difference it helps us reach new listeners all over the world and Love and Courage has been listened to people from dozens and dozens of countries in fact um over 50 something countries the last time I checked I must check in soon but it was over 50 countries oh and don't forget check out my other po new podcast it's the Creative Souls of Clare podcast which you might enjoy that's all for now folks thanks again for listening I do really appreciate your ears your time your attention and your support until next time here's to a world of more love and courage <laughs>